Okay, so the next uh, presentation will be uh, by Kian Minsuo, who is a lecturer at uh, University College of Cork. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you so much to the organizers for putting this on. I'm very excited to be here. So what I'm going to try to do is bridge a couple of the topics that have come, but I'm going to use a policy instrument to try to bridge this. Um, this is very exploratory, but I think that if it works, it gives us a very different way of thinking about biodiversity and its value and how we should address it. So my talk is about biodiversity and loss and damage. So the main claim that I want to make is that the loss and damage framework, which is part of, uh, amongst other things, the Paris Agreement from the IPCC, brings attention to biodiversity in a very different way than the way that we've seen in many of the presentations today. And in particular, I'm going to say that it uh, has less to do with the issue of estimating the material harms, which is what many of these talks have been about, how biodiversity um, impacts ecosystem services, how it impacts use and non-use value, et cetera, et cetera, but something quite different, which is um, how we think about the different uh, sources of value. So basically what I want to say is when we're mapping out what's important for climate change and bio climate change's impact on biodiversity, it depends very much on our moral assumptions. That was introduced by other of the speakers, but I'm going to try to do this in maybe a larger scale way and sort of uh, give us some context for what's been going on. The other thing that is going to happen here is I'm going to suggest that loss and damage focuses us on uh, what we can do and what adaptations are possible for biodiversity. So instead of thinking about what the costs are, it might think, uh, force us to uh, think about how we respond to biodiversity loss and how we uh, adapt to biodiversity loss in the relevant sense. So like I said, this is relatively um, uh, exploratory, but I think that it gives us a sort of an interesting new way of thinking about the relationship between biodiversity and climate change. So that's by way of introduction. I'll start by talking about how I think, um, broadly speaking, economists, but not only economists, have thought about biodiversity so far, which involves a lot of trying to estimate the costs, estimate the harms under different assumptions. And I'm going to try to problematize this by suggesting that it has deep moral assumptions. And I'm going to try to draw attention to those moral assumptions and show you some of the alternative ways that we might think of the value of biodiversity. And once I've done that and tried to give you some reasons for thinking that that kind of project has very important moral assumptions and potentially a deep intractable, potentially deep intractable moral assumptions, I'm going to suggest this alternative, which is based in the idea of loss and damage, which some of you may have heard of, but maybe many of you haven't. And it comes out of the policy process and the international governance process. OK, so to start. We can discuss the material costs of climate change uh, on biodiversity or biodiversity more generally. Um, and we've seen several instances of this from various different speakers today. So we can think about ecosystem services. We can talk about uh, capacity to develop pharmaceuticals, potential ingredients in various kinds of um, health products. Uh, we can talk about agricultural productivity, as Kathleen Schubert said earlier this morning, and so forth. There's lots of different ways we might think of the value and specifically the value to humans. But for some people, this will seem unsatisfying and uh, subject to debate. So on what grounds might we think it's unsatisfying? Well, we've seen some of them already. Um, and in particular, the question is how we would think about the sources of value. Now, why would this be subject to debate? As Simon Caney said earlier on in the day, we might want to adopt non-anthropogenic uh, or non-anthropocentric values. We might want to think about values that are not purely human-based. So those are non-use values, non-human-based non -human -based use values, and so forth. Now, it's going to be hard to get these, because obviously, however we're going about it, we're relying on our expectations to some extent on how uh, these are valued. But trying to get beyond what's explicitly uh, subjective valuation by humans is a way of trying to broaden this discussion. Now, how would we do that? So that suggests that we might want to do non-anthropocentric values, but the punchline is there's a lot of different ways we might try to get away from non-anthropocentric non values. And uh, so I'm going to run through a few of these. And the background here is that this is a discussion that's happened amongst environmental philosophers, environmental ethicists, over the past roughly four decades. And it's very, very, very extended. 
OK, so what are the alternatives? Well, the first alternative, of course, is to just grab the bull by its horns and say we're going to only care about human values, values that humans explicitly care about in terms of market and non-market values. So anthropocentrism is our first alternative. Anthropocentrism says that being human is needed to be morally considerable. So what is morally considerable in our approximations, which of course all of these are, is what humans actually value. OK. Now, there's a lot of reasons that we might be concerned about this, some of which were raised by Mark Budolfson, some of which were raised by Tatiana uh, and others. Uh, but there's all kinds of ways that we might think we want to expand. However, as I'm going to suggest, there are many different ways to expand. So the first way is what Tatiana Fischak said. So here we're going to be sentientist. So sentientists say that valuable are states or preferences that are psychologically accessible are positively or negatively valenced. So those are pleasurable states, those are painful states. That is the basis of the sentientist approach. Now, Mark Budolfson um, and Tatiana Vyshak, to, to some extent, indicated that most moral philosophers take this position. I would say that there are lots of moral philosophers that take this position, but I think that they simplified the debate a little bit. So I want to indicate um, quickly one reason why we might want to go beyond this. So there was a famous argument by um, uh, a philosopher named Kenneth Goodpaster. Uh, and he said, look, why is it important that we have positively valenced hedonistic states, like positive feeling states? And so according to the sentientists, those are intrinsically valuable states. But he said, well, what, is, what are these states actually for? If we think evolutionarily, these are mostly signaling mechanisms to the individual to seek sugars, avoid painful you know, uh, traps to avoid dangerous uh, uh, foodstuffs and so forth. So it seems that what's actually going on is that these states are not themselves valuable. They're contributing to something else, which we might think of as life or things that are good for fitness more broadly. So if we follow that line of, of criticism, that might push us towards something we call in philosophy biocentrism. Here, it's simply what is alive that's morally valuable, not necessarily linked to either the quality or even the existence of those psychological states. Now, of course, biocentrism is much more inclusive, right? We're including things that don't have states. We're going towards the plants that were brought up in the Q&A with Mark and so forth. So this is a, quite a radical view, but it seems to have a potentially quite good justification if you think that what's really important is the evolutionary search for fitness and not just the states themselves. OK, one of the things that was also brought up in pre previous Q's and A's is an even wider section because all of these do not fit very well with biodiversity. Why is that? All of these are individually focused. We're interested in the individual human. We're interested in the individual with the psychological states. We're interested in the living being, whatever that living being happens to be. One of the questions that was brought up, uh, I think it was to Mark in Q&A, was does this actually account for biodiversity value itself? So one of the things that uh, environmental philosophers have added to this discussion is the suggestion that beyond the individuals, what's valuable is the well-functioning of the um, ecological system, the ecosystem. So we might get a view that we call ecocentrism. So the ecocentric view is that ecosystems themselves are morally considerable, and all of the beings in them are important insofar as they contribute to the well-functioning of that ecosystem, perhaps the resilience or the robustness of that system, for example. Now, if we follow this route, we'll see that, of course, sometimes this is going to work and sometimes it's not, right? So if you have more biodiversity, as was suggested, in some circumstances, and I'm not an expert um, in, in the biology or the ecosystem services, um, or the ecosystem resilience. But my understanding is that there are diminishing returns. More biodiversity does not always indicate a more resilient system. And sometimes um, a, a niche can be filled by an alternative um, species, right? So you don't always need another species. But if you're ecocentric, insofar as the species contributes to the well-functioning, the robustness of that ecosystem, that's a valuable thing. OK, so what was the point of, of going over these? Uh, I think it's interesting to see this diversity of opinions. But I think that there's a background point, which is as we're do, uh, looking at biodiversity, there's all kinds of different starting moral points that we might have underneath 
our view of what is morally important. And that will feed into what we actually end up calculating. So I think it's helpful to have this in the background. And I think that there's something we can learn from the environmental um, philosophers, the environmental ethicists, which is that it's really hard to, determine, to decide between these four. There's really quite good arguments, I think, on all sides of these positions. And although it's true that many philosophers are individualists, they take one of the first three positions, um, that's not all the positions you can take, and there might be some good reasons that push you towards these others. So what I'm trying to do really here is expand the scope so you just see this, the potential, the broadness of the potential views you could take. Okay, so if that makes us a little bit more circumspect about the traditional kind of material managers, we might think about what are alternatives. And I'm going to suggest an alternative that goes quite a different way, and that's going to involve loss and damage. So loss and damages are the impacts of climate change that are beyond our ability to adapt. We can think of, for example, of, um, here's a metaphor. You can imagine a rock is, is, a, is a, on a cliff above some village. If the rock, is, imagine every push of it is emissions, right? So we're getting closer and closer to being damaging the village. If it's up on the ledge and you push it and it's not at the edge of the ledge, then if you stopped emitting, it wouldn't actually fall. Right? So you, you, the, more, the more you push it, the closer it gets. But if, you, if it's still on the ledge, it's going to stop if you stop emitting. Those we can think of as uh, impacts that are mitigable. If it falls off the ledge and now it starts rolling, those are the ones that require adaptation. Right? So the idea is that if nothing is done, they're going to hit the village and cause damage. But if they're sufficiently far away, maybe we can deflect the boulder. Maybe we can put some barrier in place or something that's going to protect the village. That's the intuitive idea of adaptation, right? So there's enough time or enough understanding that you can blunt that damage. However, some, because climate change is so advanced, some of these impacts are beyond that distance. They're close enough to us that we know we're going to get hit in various ways, or we are already being hit in various ways. So we can think of those as losses and damages. Those are the ones that are too far advanced for us to adapt to. And the reason that this was brought up in the international negotiations is especially because developing countries wanted a basis for compensation. And so that's historically the link of why we would think this is an important category. And just as a quick potted history, for those of you who don't follow COP negotiations as assiduously as I like to, so this started in COP19 in 2013. The Warsaw International Mechanism or Implementation Mechanism for Loss and Damage was the initial process of introducing this. Subsequently, of course, here in Paris, in the fabled Paris Agreement, COP21, 2015, um, loss and damage was formally adopted in Article 8. But the cost of it being introduced in, in international agreement was the US uh, required that there was no basis for uh, liability or compensation. So a couple of quick uh, introductions to this idea, which might be new to you. So loss and damage in the legal article is quite uh, heterogeneous. It includes things that we might want to work towards, early warning systems, emergency preparedness, uh, we might want to address slow onset, um, things that involve irreversible or permanent loss and damage, which is kind of um, frustrating because the article about loss and damage refers to loss and damage, which for a philosopher is very frustrating. Um, comprehensive risk assessments, risk insurance, non-economic losses, again, it's using the own terminology in the in the definition, which is very frustrating, and resilience of communities, livelihoods, and ecosystems. So what, this is a very heterogeneous list, right? And it's difficult to analyze or theorize with. But uh, as theorists, we've sort of come to this idea of beyond adaptation as being one of the easier ways or the more sophisticated ways of sort of grouping together these impacts. We might also distinguish between the losses, which are the irreversible things, and the damages, which are reversible. OK, now that I've introduced this as a concept, as a legal concept, as an international policy concept, I want to indicate how this might change our views about biodiversity. And as I said, this is very exploratory. So loss and damage in various discussions has several interpretations. In Nature Climate Change, Boyd et al. discussed this in 2017. But the, the interpretation that I'm discussing, which is this boulder coming down the hill, but it's sufficiently far advanced that it's too late for us to move, deflect, et cetera is uh, sometimes called the beyond adaptation interpretation. 
Now, if something is beyond adaptation, that requires that you understand where adaptation starts and ends. And that's really key to understanding loss and damage. So we can distinguish between two kinds of limits or ends of uh, adaptation. The hard ones, which involve our physical or engineering limits, and the soft ones, which are we have the technological capacity, but we don't do it because of social, economic, other reasons, soft, soft limits. And of course, you can also have more gradations, but these are the sort of two usual families of gradations. Okay, how would this apply to biodiversity? If we limit ourselves to climate forced impacts on biodiversity, right, of course, not all biodiversity loss is because of climate change, very clearly. A lot of it has to do with um, habitat destruction, it has to do with reforestation uh, and, and pasteurization and all sorts of other things. But if we focus just on the climate impacts, the questions are, what hard or soft limits are there to biodiversity adaptation? And I think this is a quite an interesting and quite tricky question. So if we're thinking about it in the human context, right, the hard limits, to the soft and hard limits to adaptation might involve things like building seawalls, moving people, maybe uh, raising, raising, uh, raising buildings, and so forth. But when it comes to um, biodiversity, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. My understanding is there's quite little done on how we would protect animals from biodiversity loss. And so my feeling, and this is very much, as I said, exploratory, is that thinking about it in these terms really refocuses on what is the damage and what is the cost to what can be done and what are the categories of things that can be done. Okay. So in that line, what does this raise? This raises, I think, thank you. This raises a few questions for future research. So as I said, what are hard and soft limits to adaptation? Analogously to what are hard and soft limits to human adaptation to climate change, what would it look like to protect species and what would the limits be? Would they be financial and social, which I think would apply much less to biodiversity, con uh, biodiversity uh, protection than um, physical ones where it's quite tricky because you have to have a huge amount of information about those species, about their habitats, and about how climate would imperil them. And these are things that, again, I'm not an expert, but my understanding is the li our understanding is quite limited. So that would suggest that this is quite an open area uh, or a new way of thinking about biodiversity. So of course, losses and damages are distinguished between those that are reversible and irreversible. So you would want to think about what is reversible and irreversible. At a first approximation, I would think that species extinction should be thought of as irreversible. There's only very, very imperfect uh, replacements for substitutes for a species that's lost. Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm asking a question because I think that this is an interesting way of thinking about it, an alternative way of thinking about it. For soft limits, how can we relax the constraints? So what I mean by the constraints is how can we change uh, either funding constraints, which of course are always there, or other kinds of constraints that might stop us from protecting species from climate impacts. And finally, and I think that philosophically and ethically this is the most interesting one, how would we hold, uh, how would we attribute responsibility? And the point here is that remember loss and damage originally, the whole point was to try to figure out who might be responsible for impacts from climate change beyond our ability to adapt. It seems that if there is something that's within our capacity to adapt to for species uh, biodiversity loss and we fail to do it, then that might incur responsibility in a, in a parallel way. Again, um, this, is, this is quite a different idea, but I think that it potentially could apply. So by way of conclusion, the first thing I wanted to say was that considering biodiversity in this context of loss and damage using the sort of terms and the policy context leads us away from the questions which we've discussed and are very interesting um, towards a totally new way of conceiving of this impact. So instead of thinking about here are the costs in human-centric terms and anthropocentric terms, we think about what can be done and what are the categories of things that can be done. And then finally, this is because um, well, this is because this question of how to pick the different valuations of these four options I gave you, I think is quite, quite a bit more difficult and quite a bit more difficult to address than some philosophers do. And that's, what, that's the conclusion I draw from the many decades of discussion in environmental ethics where these have been quite intractable. If biodiversity losses are true losses, meaning that they're irreversible in that strong sense, then how should that um, 
privilege avoiding losses for precautionary reasons. Some, sometimes we might think if an outcome is really seriously bad, it's irreversible, and we don't know how likely it is, then that might give us precautionary reasons. And I know that that's more influential, say in France, say in Germany, and, and in, in the continent more broadly than it is in the United States, where it's much more cost-benefit analysis um, inclined. But I think that framing, framing it in this way potentially opens precautionary arguments that might not have been available otherwise. So those are some thoughts, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you.